this book came about because I was one of those people who always said, oh, I'd love to write a novel. And then I turned 50, and you know those people who say, I'd love to play the piano? Yes. And it gets to a point where I think, you do know there's a way you could <laughs> do that. You could just take some lessons and shut up about it. Um, people often say it like, I'd love to go to Spain, or places that aren't really that far <laughs> away. away. I'd love to see Devon, so it's just there. <laughs> yeah, so I was being a bit like that about a book. I thought, I don't want to be that guy. So uh, people were kind of sniffing around to get me to do some memoirs. <laughs> and I thought, ooh, here's an idea. I'll get them to buy some memoirs but on the proviso, they also publish this novel that they know nothing about, and they have no guarantee of its, you know, any, any quality threshold. Um, and <laughs> happily... Uh, they Hod didn't read the small print. Hodder said, Hodder said yes, and so uh, it forced me to write a novel, because I think anyone can start a novel. It's very easy to start a novel. Finishing <laughs> is the really difficult bit, and that's where you need someone emailing you going, eh, that novel we paid you for, <laughs> any sign of it? Uh, I was talking to someone at the office, and they, I said something about the, the novel, and I said, I'd like it to be quite good, and they went, oh, you want it to be good? And I said, well, look at it this way, if you finish your novel, and this is a good thing for anything in life, really, you know, it's like building a shelf or anything, if you finish it, it'll be one of the best books in the world. And it's true, because the vast majority of books are in drawers, <laughs> they're in files in some dusty part of your computer, they're unfinished. Sure. And a shelf is just two brackets and a plank of wood on the floor, if unfinished. Exactly. So I see the analogy, yeah. yeah. You, you've been drawn to, like you said, a story that maybe people wouldn't have... Ex you surprised yourself in the story that you wrote. I heard you say that you thought that you would maybe go for something a bit more cynical. Maybe it's quite a sentimental story in, in lots of places. It is. I... Somehow, when I was a kid, and I, I yeah, and I guess it's about who, who you become and when you write a novel. I mean, it's very, it, it, you know, I, I, when I, I finished this book on my 53rd birthday, and there aren't many things you do for the first time at 53. Um, and so I suppose your novel is in a way dictated by who you are at the, at the time of writing. And I have slightly become a sentimental old fool. <laughs> so I think if I'd written my first novel when I intended to, sort of in my 20s, it would have been a much more cynical, world-weary, eye-rolly, isn't everybody stupid book. And <laughs> Which I would love to read, to be fair. <laughs> um, and, and this is, I don't know, it's a bit more forgiving, I think. I mean... Is there a, a risk with that? With it, obviously, it's not autobiographical, but the, the nature of it being a familiar world and being very from you and, and the point that you're at, is, is there a risk that people are going to think that you've drawn on reality very closely? I mean, Dunneen, for example, I mean, is, is, is that very reminiscent of where you grew up? Um, the locations in the book are all borrowed. Um, and the cent there's, actually, there's a central thing in the book that is drawn from life. But if, and in fact, I thought it was going to be the center of the book, and it turns out it wasn't. I was walking uh, with my mother, and there's, a, there's a very odd thing in our, I'm sure this must happen in, in Britain, if you're walking through a village, but it doesn't really happen in London in the same way, and that's my experience of, of the UK. But in Ireland, if you're walking down the road, every house, every house you pass has an extraordinary story that, oh, this is where uh, Mrs. So-and-so, she had an affair with the daughter's maths teacher. Mm. Uh, this is, da -da -da. well, of course, she had to go to London. And <laughs> then... Uh, is that like th purgatory? Yeah, yeah, this is so-and-so, uh, you know, they had, uh, they were bitten by a tropical spider on a yeah. holiday in Australia. She died there, but they mm. brought her body back. That, <laughs> and, it, and it just seems, every house seems to have one of those things. So I was walking with my mother and... And mums know them all as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so walking along and there was, it was, just, it was a country lane. And I just noticed a kind of a glint of sunlight. I thought, what was that? And I looked into the kind of these bushes and you could see, oh, that's a bit of glass. And then you cross the road and look back and it was sort of roughly the outline of a house, but completely consumed by foliage and bushes and ivy and all sorts. And my mother said, oh yes, that house, that house was owned by a farmer, and there were three sisters who lived down here, and one of the sisters uh, was his housekeeper. Uh, but everyone knew that more was going on, and that one day he would make an honest woman of her. And she 
was at home and she looked in the newspaper and she saw his engagement notice for another woman. Good or noise, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so his engagement notice for another woman who had land on the other side of the valley. And she did have land, guys. Come yeah. On. <laughs> yeah. And she went to the house. He wasn't there. He was obviously off with the woman with the land. And I, I, this is my mother's version of the story, that she cleaned the house and she came out, locked the door, and no one ever went into that house again. And nature took it back. So that, I love that That's image amazing, of that house. Yeah. So that, I thought that image of that house would be kind of very central to the book. In fact, it's not, it's sort of peripheral. And, the, and the, I also, to just write that sort of bleak, bittersweet romance of that for a whole novel, I thought uh, was sort of beyond me as a, a novice novelist. Okay. So I kind of put in a crime element and a sort of whodunit and yeah. But you get lots of glimpses of that heart. Yes, yeah. no, the, 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 the sisters are yeah. in the book, yeah. Oh gosh, that's, that's actually crushed my soul a little bit. That's so sad. <laughs> You're like, and I bought that house, bulldozed it, and now it's modern flats. It's yeah, beautiful. lovely, lovely views. <laughs> I wondered if actually that was kind of um, a similar thought that I had about when you're planning these people's lives, obviously we only see so much on the page. We don't get to know everything that you know about them. So do you have sort of spider di diagrams or you know, lists of attributes about them that we don't know yet, but it helps you flesh them out? I did make a lot of, because I, 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 you know, you kind of ask people for advice about things. Mm. And uh, the only person who did give me advice, what well, now I've got, oh, David Nichols. Uh, who wrote One Day and... and uh, Good person to ask. Yeah, that's what I thought. And he said, people get, you know, very uh, snobbish about writing frameworks and structures and things, but he said, do it. It's the only bit of advice I have for you. Have a framework, and then and you don't have to stick to it. Things can go off in either direction. You get lost, and surprising things happen. And that, and that is true. All of that did happen. But I did do a structure. And so... Do you I, mean a narrative framework? Narrative framework, but then within it, you know, you know how old people are. Okay. Th you know, things about yeah. them. Um, but then, you know, because when I interview writers, and the, they kind of go, oh, and the characters took on a life of their own. You think, oh, shut up. <laughs> and... But in fact, it did happen. There is that excitement. You're, you're writing, and then you kind of think, oh my God, at the end of the next page, I know what's going to happen, and oh, I can't wait to get there. This is really exciting. And those, you are, those are the great days. Those are the really good days uh, of doing a novel. Where it, where, yeah, there must be days where you think, I've just written a chapter, and I don't even remember where, you know, sitting down and starting, and then other days it must be really tough. And, other, and that's the, the other thing you've got to do, is keep a going. You know, just... It, and I think that's why most books end prematurely <laughs> because people hit the hard day and stop down tools and kind of think, oh, I'm stuck. Whereas if you have a deadline, you have to deliver this thing, you have to keep going. Yeah. Even if you're thinking, oh God, why will anyone ever want to read this? And I don't know why I'm doing it. And da, da, da. Just, you've got to go through those days. I and love then the you idea get, that yeah. it was your party, your 53rd party, and you were like, and quick, <laughs> and done. <laughs> and, it, and it was really annoying because I had a dinner and uh, I was saying, oh, you know, I've, I've woken up this morning, I've finished novel. And they went, uh, oh, how amazing it must have been just to type the end. And I thought, I didn't type the end. I didn't do that. Ah, I'll never get the chance again. Um, is it, uh, uh, do the worlds overlap? I mean, we said this is, this is a complete departure really from your, from your day job. But I feel like you're a people watcher. I mean, in what, in what you do with, with a TV show, you're looking at people, how they, what their little foibles are. You're kind of looking for that connection and that you're very disarming. Is, are you, were you kind of logging all of that and then that came out in the book? But aren't we all, I think we all do that. Yeah. I think we all do that and that's why people, people like telling stories and why people like reading stories. And that's in the end what this book is. It is a story, it is a tale and hopefully there's enough twists and turns and things to keep you occupied as, as, as you go along. There's, I suppose there's an odd thing on the chat show, and I think it, it, uh, and it, it confounds a lot of people who get given chat shows, in that, because it's called 
the whoever show, you know, the Graham Norton show, the, your name's in the title if you have a chat show. So on one level, it's very high status. You walk out, there's 600 people in the studio going, yay, yay you. So it's very gratifying, you think, yay me, aren't I great? <laughs> but then... Don't you hate it when that happens? Oh. But, but then conversely, the minute a guest walks out, you're playing low status. And it doesn't matter who you have on the sofa, you have to elevate them and say, this person is more interesting, this person is more talented, this person is, is funnier than me. You're kind me. of a conduit for them being their best, their best self in a way, aren't that's, you? Yeah, that's the idea. Because, but I think a lot of people get a chat show thinking it's going to be about them. Mm. And it can't be. Not long term, anyway. I think you can do that short term, or you can do a kind of a, a, a comedy uh, chat show, like Mrs. Merton or something like that, where it is about Mrs. Merton and the guests are just there for her to do some jokes. Um, but uh, you have to be very, you have to be very, very disarming. That's the word I always think of with you: very disarming, and and get people on side very quickly. I imagine because you. I presume don't have a lot of time with them beforehand. Sometimes I can the be straight. Le from the less the better. Really? Honestly, I like meeting them when they walk on. Do you really? Yeah. Well, I think, why talk to them over there? No one's listening to that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's do it now. Save time. I'm getting paid for that bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's, I, I, that is how I, I do like to just do it in front of the audience. And then, but then there is an odd thing, too, where you have to have a... You can't be too cowed by the people because you have to drive it through and you have to shut them off if they're wanging on too much. So I suppose, yes, I suppose I, uh, that's probably what I would say I'm uh, best at, if good at anything. Do you think people perhaps think that it's going to be more of a hatchet job? Especially Amer like American or like non-British guests think, oh, actually, they're going to try and catch me out. Yes, I think, I think Americans often come to Britain because of our tabloid press, or just our press, uh, <laughs> they come here and they think they're out to get me. Mm. And, you know, and that if I do meet people beforehand, I am at pains to kind of stroke their arm and kind of go, look, um, this is, we're not about embarrassing you, we're not about making you uh, feel awkward. If I ask you anything that you don't want to answer, just, like, I mean, it's hard to say this to someone, but kind of like, I really couldn't care less. So, <laughs> <laughs> I have no interest in you. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, but kind of like, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't care. You know, yeah. I, I, this isn't a political interview. This isn't a thing. It's just a, a jolly, you know, diverting thing. Yeah. So if you don't want to answer a question, don't. I'll ask you another one. Yeah. It's fine. You know, don't, don't feel like I'm trying to trap you. Yeah, so you, and I suppose they have to, they have to trust you to a certain extent because, you, you know, you want them to open up and... Well, that takes a long time, I think. Yeah. And actually, it's not about the guests so much as the publicists and the studios. Okay. And you need to get them on side and they need to trust you. And that's how you get the bookings. Yeah. Uh, the bookings come when they can look their client in the eye and kind of go, this show's fine. Yeah. And then there's no repercussions afterwards. Yeah. If there's repercussions afterwards, then all hell breaks loose. People yeah. love to get pissed on your show, though. Um, you mean drunk? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're a little tipsy, I would say. We've only had very few absolute, as we would say in Ireland, langers. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who are you thinking of? Um, the langers one, <laughs> uh, Mickey Rourke. Uh, oh, my. Got, uh, he got out of a car holding a bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> that was open. Um, <laughs> So you thought, ooh, hello. Uh, <laughs> so he was quite challenging. Um, Mark Wahlberg's been good as gold. I but, always think of Mark Wahlberg, but, yes. he, but he was, on that one episode, he was. A bit tipsy. Yeah, but it was good because it was me, Sarah Silverman, and Michael Fassbender. And I felt the three of us have met a lot of drunk people. So <laughs> actually, none of us were that phased by it. We just thought, ooh, yeah, you know. Do you, do you have a bevy? Do you have a little tip? I always have a white wine, like I have tonight, I have a white wine with me. Um, I, I have it to sip, and it, it from stand-up days, where when I used to do stand-up, friends would come and they'd go, ooh, it was good, but you did seem a bit nervous. Mm. You seemed a bit nervous. And then I was doing, I mean, the gig, I was doing this gig for the Australian Tourist Commission. Can you imagine how bad this was? <laughs> and uh, 
and in fact, it might have been the Northern Territories. I'm not sure. It's very specific. And anyway, I was doing this thing, and it was a kind of cheese and wine kind of bun fight thing. And then at some point, I had to get up just in a room and do my turn. Oh no, what, like this? Especially, yes, oh. specially written material about the Northern Territories, oh, whatever. No. <laughs> so, is, this, is there a video of this anywhere? Happily, no. <laughs> uh, so anyway, because it was a, because I came from a theatre background, I went to drama school, you know, for me, it was absolutely, you know, you would never drink before you perform, you would never touch anything before you go on. That was absolutely, you know, verboten. Um, but because it was a, this cheese and wine bash, and I was supposed to be another guest at the thing, I had to be holding a glass of wine. It's a little sip, don't you? And, um, and it was extraordinary, because I was nervous, the adrenaline is in you, you could feel the alcohol kind of in you. <laughs> yeah. It was really amazing. And just that couple of sips just took the edge off the nerves. And from then on, I kind of went, right, I'm going to do this. Now, if it gets to the point where I'm having a couple of bottles before I go <laughs> on, uh, I should really uh, calm down. But it, I'm still on the one glass. And, you know, and the, you know I, I come off, I go on set with a glass of wine, I come off set with the same glass of wine. Yeah. But it's just a nice thing to have, just a sip. And maybe it does kind of relax guests as well, because you're kind of thinking, well, he's not taking it very seriously. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's his show, why should I care? <laughs> Top me up again. <laughs> Hi, Graham. Hello. Um, sadly, I can't top the red chair question, but uh, my question would be, if you could give an advice to your younger self, what would that be? Ooh. Uh, my advice to my younger self would be the same to any young person, is you've got more time than you think. Um, I think when you're young, you think you've got to hit immediately. You know what I mean? You've got to... You've got to get into university. You've got to get the good job. You've got to get a mortgage. You've got to get a, you know, all those things. You must do them as quickly as possible. And you don't. Uh, I remember when I was in San Francisco, I was, I think I was 20. And there was, I was living in a hippie commune. It's a long story. And uh, there was a woman there, and she was 40, maybe 41. And she'd gone back to college to train as a nurse. And in my sweet, young Irish way, I must have somehow said to her, hopefully not as rudely as this, was I, why on earth would you bother getting a new job? You're so old. Um, and that she, disarming nature again. Yeah, and she kind of said, like, well, hang on, if I, I'm 40, you know, if I do this job till I retire, I'll be doing it for 25 years, which is longer than I'd been alive <laughs> when I was asking the question. And it was a kind of a, a, a bit of a eureka moment for me, a really stupid thing, it's such an obvious thing. But I think young people don't quite get that, that actually you can, you have time to fail. You have time to wander down paths that are totally irrelevant. When you look back at your life in your 80s, you'll go, oh my God, remember that time when for four years I lived in Vienna and I was trying to be an oboist. Um, and, <laughs> And it won't, have, it won't have really impacted on your life at all, but it's something you did. And I think that's what I'd like my younger self to, I'd, I'd tell myself, my younger self, to calm down, don't panic. Um, that actually all the kind of weird, odd things you were doing will somehow, at some point in your life, and for me, well, I didn't earn a penny till I was 33 years old, um, you know. Everyone else was panicking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> parents. <laughs> God, we love no, your laissez-faire philosophy. Yeah. But. No, my poor parents, you know, when other, you know, they met the neighbours and, you know, it'd be like, oh, Dorothy's a vet and so-and-so's, uh, oh, he's just <laughs> opened another factory. And uh, what's Graham doing? Oh, you know, uh, <laughs> I, it was tragic. I, I was to be living pitied. in Vienna, being yeah, yeah. It was to be. It was. To, I was to be pitied. So uh, yeah. 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 <laughs>